Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and maybe you have a great idea that you want to turn into a product one day. So in this episode we are starting with the idea, concept and then we look at all the troubles that you have when you build your first prototype. Let's get started. No matter if you're building consumer electronics like cell phones, dev boards or even fully professional test equipment, they all start with a first initial prototype. Most new products are actually iterations on products that you already have. So basically we're taking something that we like, add to it, make it better in some way, repackage it maybe in a more convenient form factor and then it gets put on the market. So a lot of stuff is actually derivative of something else. And for this video we're gonna do exactly the same thing because it's the most common scenario. We're taking an everyday item, add to it and then try to build a working prototype. I've used this USB card reader for years now and guess what? It starts to fail. The contacts are wearing out, uh, the contact is not reliable anymore so it doesn't really mount the drives when I plug them in here in the USB ports and sometimes it can't read the SD cards. And I've already had a few corrupt that because of bad contacts. So I need a new one. Turns out this was already a really inconvenient form factor for me. I think it's made for laptops or so and I use it on a desktop. And I searched for alternatives to this but they are all similar to this, the same model, or they don't have the features I like, or the form factor isn't just what I'm looking for. So I make my own card reader and I try to add to it to make it somehow unique to cater to the audience that is like me, people that tinker with electronics. So let's see what makes up a USB card reader and then what we can add to it. So what makes up a USB card reader? Thankfully, I have a ton of parts <laughs> of all varieties, so I should have some that work for that project. Usually it's a USB hub and a media controller. Media controllers can be only for a specific set of cards, like SD cards, for example, or compact flash or whatever, or they can be combined. And previously I have only used dedicated hub chips, dedicated media controllers, and this time I want to try out something new, a combined one. So there's actually a hub on there that also has a universal uh, media controller on there. So um, yeah, I'm trying to find some parts that we can use for a project and then we hop over to KiCad. For a lot of prototypes you will get by with an Arduino, some wires, some breakout boards and you can already test your project. But if you have to use specialized chips then you will already have to make a PCB on the initial prototype run. Also, if you are trying to achieve a certain form factor, doing a PCB helps you determine if that form factor is even achievable. Here we have the PCB, kind of wink from the future, because we first have to show how that one got made and designed. Welcome to my computer and KiCad. This is the schematic for this project. I did not waste too much time on the exact specifics of each part, why this one has been chosen and stuff. It's the main point is to get something in production that we can try stuff on and that we can see if the concept is viable. So I've used different USB chips before and this time I'm trying to use a combined one that has a USB hub and a media controller. I haven't tried that before. If I find that this doesn't work, I can just fall back to the ones that I know, so I use this iteration to try that out. We have two USB ports on here, USB-C in that case. One is basically doing the main data connection, the other one is just providing additional power, so we can decide to give more power to this external facing USB port than uh, usually we could provide with just one port. USB is usually restricted to 500 milliamps on USB 2.0 standards, and then USB 3.0 can deliver more, but we have to restrict that somehow. And in case we give this device more than the 500 milliamps, we have to also be able to provide them. And that is why we can just double up the ports to have that easily. I'm using an USB-C3. You can basically use any microcontroller. Uh, my idea with that is 
I would like to have the current settings be controllable via software, via USB. So I can basically type in a command and it changes how much current is provided and maybe also later on over Bluetooth. My current circuit is not the best one. It's not the newest parts or anything. It's just a circuit that I found online for current regulation that seems to work fine. The main point is I need to find if current regulation at all is sensible, if that even makes sense for a USB hub for testing gadgets and, and uh, using them safely. Because it maybe it could be when I change the settings of this device, then maybe uh, the USB port stops working or maybe the device disconnects or glitches or whatever. If I encounter any of those problems, then I can basically scrap the concept. So the first thing is just have any working design with any parts that you have in stock. And then we move on to making it more efficient and uh, finding parts that are commonly uh, available and have a long service uh, time. So that all comes after the stuff. I still use USD protection uh, circuits on there, even though I route them like they don't do anything, uh, just to have these footprints A as possible test points and B just to be sure about ESD problems, because sometimes they can just mess up your problem. And I also already put them in here because I can ju just copy paste onto my next iteration. And if we look in the finished design, and you can see I have routed all the power traces are a lot thicker than the other ones. Signal traces all have a standard thickness. I did not waste much time on uh, doing this layout, just a quick one. The only things I made sure is that these traces can uh, carry all the power that they need to provide and also that the USB lines are routed in differential pairs and not just anywhere and I added some ground vias so they are a bit shielded. And that is pretty much it. The goal is to get this as fast as possible into production. And this is how it looks like. You can see here's a current shunt on there and here are two test points. And that means we can just attach a multimeter on these points, get voltage readings, and these can be converted then into current readings. We could also measure the current directly, but this way we can also test if the microcontroller reads the current correctly at the same points or reads the voltage correctly at the same points and then does the conversion right into current. Because in the end we will have the microcontroller measure the current, regulate this to the desired target and these posts are for us to check if the microcontroller does the job right. But that is down the line. Uh, also this footprint here is SD card. Uh, holder that I didn't use before and I had to make my own footprint for that one because I couldn't find a fitting one and maybe we have some clearance issues with these uh, little traces here because that is very fine pitched but it it was uh, set that way in the data sheet so let's hope that works otherwise we fail often and fast and in the next iteration we use a different port okay let's get this thing into production The feature that I want to add to this USB hub to make it unique, like a unique selling proposition, a USP, is current control. When you are building USB devices and you are tinkering around with stuff that is powered via USB, then you have to follow the USB specs. At least when you're trying to put those on the market, they have to follow. And usually that means the device has to restrict the current it takes in up to whatever that port can deliver. So they have to negotiate that. There has to be some exchange of information and worst case if there is no information exchanged then you have to restrict it to a safe amount. So there won't be any troubles. Usually the USB tells you you have to do it on both sides the host and the client. So in case one of those messes up the other one still keeps everything in control. But if you are prototyping USB gadgets you won't implement that right from the start. You first like try to get everything else working, then you are focusing on the details. So my USB hub should be perfect for those people that are tinkering around with their own uh, inventions and their own gadgets, and they use USB for powering or for data transfer. So if you plug it into that hub, it's always safe, no matter 
if your prototype is a bit wonky on the USB side. So you can't kill your computer with that USB device if the worst case scenario happens. Almost all of the projects we do on the show get custom enclosures, usually 3D printed. But if you're making a product, you can't always get a fully custom enclosure because it's just too expensive to manufacture in small batches. And if you're 3D printing every single one of them, you may shortly run into manufacturing contingencies because you can't just print enough of them. So one thing that really works good and has been tried and true and proven by the industry is using standard enclosures. These are made by Hammond Manufacturing. You can get them on Element 14 in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And I chose this specific form factor for mine because it's just wide enough to accommodate the USB port that I want to put on this thing. But it's still the most compact version that I'm confident I can fit all the parts into. If I would use only USB-C, then I could use this flatter one. And if I want to have a lot of ports on there, then I could use this one. And the nice thing about these standard enclosures is that the only modification that you usually have to make is custom end plates. And I can easily 3D print or laser cut or mill custom end plates or even just order ready-made ones if I want to produce in bulk. So for small batches and for prototypes, these enclosures are a really great way to give your project a sturdy uh, feel to it. And they also look good so you can present your prototype to like investors or whoever you want to show it to. And it already looks like a really neat package. The shape of the PCB of my prototype is dictated by the enclosure I want to use. Where do I get those shapes? Of course, from the data sheet. Every reputable manufacturer has data sheets on the enclosures they sell and quite often they have ready-made step modules. So you can just import the step file, for example, into FreeCAD, trace it or use ready-made PCB files that they have to size your PCB accordingly. And if you are not getting any of those files, usually you can trace all the important stuff directly from the data sheet. Thanks to Eisler for providing the PCBs for this project and they don't come alone. I usually get three. One for my documentation, so I can test if all the stuff on the actual PCB is right. The second one to just build it and see if there are any troubles. And the third one is for debugging. So I use one, see what is wrong with it. Then I use another one and do all kinds of bodges and tests to see if that fixes anything. If they work, I bring it over to the other board and see where I get from there. And then based on these findings and changes, I make the next iteration. That's why I get three and not 500 and also not one. Hi, I'm David from Element 14's The Electronics Inside. Join me as I tear down toys, tools, appliances, modern, vintage, classics, and even some new releases just to find out what's inside. So why on earth am I using these ancient parts like an LM317 and a digital pot that is not even available anymore? Because I have those parts and because they are part of a circuit that will mostly work. The important thing is not to make the most efficient stuff right away or the best solution for anything or the cheapest one. It's to prove your concept. So with a proven circuit, I already know that this will work in some way and I can test if the concept in relation to my project works. So if I use a proven current regulation circuit, then I can test will changing that current glitch out my USB devices. Maybe they stop working if I change any of the settings or will it have any ripples in there that will trigger some protection circuitry? Maybe. I only can find it out if I test it. And when I know that concept even works, then I can go on to make a better circuit with modern available parts and a more efficient circuitry. But step by step, this is not important yet. So on one side, we have this ancient through hole part circuit that is derived from a schematic I found on the internet for LM317 current regulation uh, circuit. So that is just to prove the concept of current regulation, if that even makes sense for a USB hub. That's my proof of concept part. The other thing is 
the aspect of trying out new parts. So this is, <laughs> of course, constructed as a demonstration for you. Uh, this is a pretty complicated to handle USB media controller, including a hub for USB 2.0 speeds. And I have no experience with such parts. I only know them separately. So this is basically using what I've learned previously, trying to combine it into one chip for maybe power or cost savings and try to implement it that way. If this works, I can go on from there. If this doesn't work, then I use different parts in my next iteration. But I want to test as many aspects of the device as early as possible to know which ones make sense and which ones are complete bogus. So what are the troubles that we can see already on our first prototype and which ones are likely that you may encounter them in your first prototype. So trouble one, I plug this in and the computer doesn't recognize it. Why could that be? So let's look at how the signal is traveling through there and what has to happen for the computer to recognize this board. So it comes in over USB-C. That means USB-C has to be configured correctly to work. Then it goes into this combined hub chip. That means my first uh, place of failure is the connector and then it's the hub chip itself. USB-C ports can be pretty finicky to solder and guess what? I also managed to rip them out while testing and when I ripped them out, I already could see that two of the pins underneath weren't correctly soldered and now some traces are broken. Those traces aren't really crucial to the operation, so I can resolder those, but still the connector didn't reflow properly. So I have to think about my reflow profile for these connectors. The big metal shielding that sucks up heat. Same goes for the USB microcontroller that I have on here. Those need a bit more heat than like all the other small components on here. So this is a failure point that can happen pretty often. Replugged it again and it still doesn't enumerate. So my next point of failure is the USB chip. Maybe my implementation of the reference design wasn't correct. Let's look at the data sheet to find out what's wrong. In the data sheet we can see uh, that something is missing. I forgot to do the R bias resistor. So for a USB device to correctly work, two things are really crucial. The crystal oscillator, usually 24 megahertz, has to work perfectly fine. That means the load capacitors on there have to be spot on. And also the traces to these crystals have to be as short as possible. So you don't get any interference in there. And also there has to be a resistor from the R bias pin down to ground. And this one has to be as precise as possible. So what's missing? The R bias, because I was too fast on the PCB layout and forget that one. And that can happen easily. Here on my testing board or my debugging board, I have added this little board here with two yellow wires. On this little board is a 10k and a 2k resistor in series because I don't have a 12k resistor, couldn't you believe that? And when I measure them I'm getting 12.03 kilo ohm. So that should be within the 1% range that the USB device is asking for. So let's plug this in and see if it works now. We got our first success, now the device is enumerating. So the computer is recognizing there is a device on this port and it already knows what it is. It says microchip, USB to SD card bridge, and it also says it's a USB hub. So it actually recognizes two devices on here, but it doesn't recognize the upstream device, which is this microcontroller. So that is weird. I also tried, of course, to put it in download boot mode. So my consideration with this is now that I know that the USB hub wasn't correctly reflowed. I also think that this chip might have been not correctly reflown. So the, the way to see if that is the case is to remove it and look underneath. I have removed the chip and indeed below there I can see some signs of not correctly reflown. Some of the pads seem to be partially reflown and not fully and that can trip everything up. So now that I know that this side of the PCB has the most heat sucking components, this might not be the ideal configuration for any production design. So I have to rethink my choice of microcontroller and package and also my position of reflow. And also the most important thing, there are about zero test points for me to probe signals on the microcontroller. All the pads are underneath. 
So for the next iteration, I add a lot test points for all the parts that I may or may not have to measure. And speaking of measuring, when I try to insert a SD card in there, it recognizes that a card is there, but it does not mount it. And I've added these two wires here to measure is there power applied to the card and does the card detect pin change. Turns out card detect does not change, write protect does change, and according to the datasheet, that is expected behavior. And usually the, as I understand the datasheet, controller should provide 200 milliamps of power at 3.3 volts to the card on its own via a dedicated pin, but it doesn't enable that pin. And I've seen multiple references for using an EEPROM with all the vendor ID and all the settings stored in there, so the device can actually read those settings. And I thought it could maybe just fall back to defaults because all the other chips that I used for USB devices do that. I'm not sure about this one. Maybe you have the insights on this USB 2640. Maybe you know why it doesn't enumerate, what am I doing wrong, or does it really need to have all these devices set? Maybe via the USB protocol that is uh, possible to set all these things, but I think that only works if you have an EEPROM attached to it, or can it even work without any EEPROM on there? Maybe not. So now we have a prototype that showcases all the troubles that you usually have with an initial prototype, but we can still learn a lot from them, so those are never wasted. First, our PCB perfectly fits the case, so we know we can use that case, and also, we can directly derive our face plates from that. So if I just put it on there, you can see, oh yeah, that fits. We can directly manufacture that if you want to. But the insides have to have another iteration. One thing that I wanted to try out is using really cheap full-size SD card connectors, and I could not find a footprint for that one. So I have to find a similar footprint and I adapted it so it would fit this device. And maybe there's a hiccup with the right protect and the card detect pins. So that could also be an issue. According to the data sheet, I should be right, but maybe the data sheet is wrong. So we don't know that yet. For the next prototype, we will of course use a different USB chip because we don't really know how that one works and use proven ones. So we fall back on a proven design, just like uh, we do with the current regulation. We fall back on a known working SD card connector that we've used before and then do the next iteration also with a microcontroller where we can probe all the points. So showcasing what can go wrong and also <gasps> there is no silk screen writing on there. In a year or two I have no idea which version that is. So always put silk screen with your versioning offer or whatever project this even is on there. So in case you encounter your devices later, you have to look something up how you did it back in the day, then you would need to know which version that even is. Today we made a device that is pretty much the typical experience that you will have when you make a product prototype. The first one never works as intended, but there's a lot to learn from that. And there are some strategies to help you on the way and some learnings that you can get from every iteration. So this is typical. Did I make some of those mistakes on purpose? Maybe some of them. But also my own are in there because I wasn't familiar with that chip and I assumed it just works like all the others that I used, which is not the way it is. If you have expertise on the USB 2640 and want to share what you think I did wrong with that, if you have experiences with prototyping, please share them on the Element 14 community. We all can learn from each other. And if you want to have uh, your questions answered, also go to Element 14 and just post them under this video and I'll be happy to answer all of them. Sometimes we make projects that work on the first try, sometimes they need a few iterations and sometimes I make errors on purpose so I can illustrate all the hardships that I go through <laughs> when doing these projects. But I'm always learning with you at the same time. So there are also some errors that I did not on purpose on there. Let me know in the Element 14 community which ones do you think are on purpose and which ones are accidental. And I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me. <laughs>